a systematic review on this pub, on this subject that put together data from 18 studies has shown that this is not an uncommon problem. We are talking about uh, you know, around 15% of people who say that they are concerned about data fabrication, falsification, or other issues um, in their colleagues, and about 2% admit in their own work. When complaints are made and investigations are carried out, in fact, a proportion are found to have conducted misconduct, but in a substantial proportion, no such finding is made and, uh, and all clear uh, is given to the authors following investigation. So you can see that even after your trial is published, you as an author remain responsible for cooperating with anybody who is undertaking misconduct allegation investigations. Depending on the allegation and the result of the outcome, result of or the outcome of the investigation, an expression of conduct of concern may be issued by the journal. And then a clarifier may be issued afterwards if no finding is made following investigation. But if an investigation reaches a particular conclusion, the article may be retracted. And in the course of investigation uh, of uh, suspected fraud or fabrication, there are guidelines that journals will follow. Uh, and one example of these guidelines is shown here, uh, provided by the Committee on Publication Ethics. This is called post-publication peer review or investigation of allegation of data fabrication. Now, frequently, these data fabrication allegations are made through analysis of published article. The analysis of public article may involve various assessments. For example, whether the registration was retrospective, whether there is a mismatch between the RCT paper published and the trial registration. So you can see that as an author, it is important for you to make sure that it is demonstrable to the reader that your paper is based on properly registered trial that is compliant with what is registered and what is published in the protocol. And there are many other aspects uh, that other people look at, and I won't go into detail, but only gave you two examples uh, relevant. However, beware that these aspects may not necessarily themselves be valid. And therefore, there is also a concern that complaints are made in error or not made in good faith. I, I notice there are some comments coming in, so I'll have a quick look at the chats. Uh, okay, th th thank you. You appear to be making comments that are uh, not raising questions at the moment. So I will continue. At this moment, I'll also, if you don't mind, have a quick look if any comment has been made via WhatsApp. And it appears that uh, that uh, I, I, I have the green signal to keep continuing with my presentation. So here is a checklist used by journals issued by a particular journal in a published article which says that if various features that they inspect various features at the time of submission so you can see one of those features is they look at the fact as to how many authors are listed in the submitted article and if there are less than three authors per systematic review, sorry, per randomized trial published, they might ask you for more information at the time of submission. Now, I highlight this here because you can see the journal chief editor has issued this guideline. But even on this guideline, there are comments raised about the article of this journal chief editor himself. And in their own published study, uh, there may be other issues uh, 
that may be raised. Uh, for example, Stephen Sen points out, uh, he's, a, he's, he's a famous statistician, uh, that maybe the tests used for, uh, uh, for uh, making or generating allegations of concern about a trial do not necessarily comply with standards for statistics and that in one case the author of the test himself admits that his test may not identify fraud accurately so in fact post-publication tests for data integrity need further validation research and uh, i make this point because one of the subjects of research in our own department here in university of granada relates to how integrity tests for clinical trials need to be validated in the future. Transparency is one of the key issues being demanded of trials as we talk today in this workshop. And there is a balance between transparency and demands for transparency uh, which are not based on proper uh, investigation. Uh, and therefore, uh, I urge you as future investigators of trials to be wary of this problem that you might be, uh, be questioned about your trial in the future and that, be yet that you are prepared for it in order that when questions are raised, they are addressed in a transparent fashion and that you are given the all clear as you go forward. So with this background, uh, we have a quick look at the journey of your submitted article once the trial is completed. Editor will assess and maybe ask you for resubmission, maybe ask for more information. They may reject the article or when it is resubmitted, they may ask for, uh, for example, they may ask you to provide your raw data. If you have provided the raw data and it is reanalyzed by the journal itself and the answers match with the answers that you provided in the manuscript, your article may be uh, evaluated for these aspects that I highlight here, prospective registration, statistical analysis plan, data sharing, transparency declaration, other features uh, listed here, and then your article may be published. <clears throat> my, my objective is to highlight that it is better to avoid entering in a difficult conversation after publication and ensure that you already do all these things that I list here as you go along in your study to reassure journal editors and readers that you have complied uh, with honesty and transparency requirements in order to ensure that your trial has integrity. Demonstrably, demonstra demonstrably it has integrity as people read it. The future of science will use artificial intelligence. So please be mindful that your registration document, your protocol, your statistical analysis plan, your manuscript that is submitted, available as a preprint or already published, may be subjected to assessments using artificial intelligence. And then issues may be raised about them for which you may be questioned. So with this background in mind, you have in fact in your handout been provided on page 88 of your handout, a summary of a consensus concerning clinical trial integrity. This trial integrity statement consensus was, as you can see here, prospectively registered on the 3rd of December, 2021 before the consensus project was started and this allowed us to demonstrate that the consensus project is itself uh, available to the public for uh, inspection ahead of 
the conduct of the consensus. The consensus panel had various range of expertise relevant to clinical trial, to all the aspects of a trial, from the protocol development going all the way to its approval and use uh, uh, in, in, in a guideline. And the trial started with several, hundred, uh, several tens of statements that were subjected to consensus. And ultimately, through consensus process, 88 statements were agreed upon and summarized in a consensus statement, which is now available uh, as a preprint. But the data as to how the consensus went through the various rounds are already shared publicly on the 29th of June in 2022, approximately six, seven months after registration of the project and completion of the work. And then the project went through a peer review being, peer review being, uh, uh, being taken, undertaken by a journal, but the preprint of the article already available for public scrutiny, even outside the peer review process that is normally confidential within the journal. And this uh, preprint has now been accepted uh, on, in, on, the, on, on the 3rd of March, just a few weeks earlier than this presentation uh, in the journal. And as you can see, even before publication, it has been uh, viewed over a thousand times. So I urge you to use the same strategy for your own work. Preprint uh, at the time of submission, uh, data sharing at the time of submission, uh, registration ahead of undertaking the first randomization. And this allows you to follow a process that is entirely open and demonstrable. And the integrity statement can contains the statements under these six headings, which will allow you to conduct and publish your trial with demonstrable integrity. So in conclusion, your trials are not just for publication, they are for benefiting patients in the society. The doubts about research integrity are in fact shocking, and you should be able to nip this evil in the bud within your project by prospective registration, by protocol publication, by monitoring, inspection, and audits, and by demonstrating that these reports are all available publicly uh, in a website or in the, pro in the registration website or in an open science forum where you can publicly make your data available transparently and with this, you can have your trial published with integrity demonstrable at every step from ethics approval all the way through to publication and post-publication aspects. And with this, I bring my presentation to a close. And if time allows, I will be happy to take any questions. I already note that... Uh, I already note that a question has been uh, has been uh, ha has been posted on the chat, and I just read out the question quickly and briefly, and then try to address it. The question says that for medical products, articles claiming newer activities, uh, doses other than approved, and many other claims already registered. So do these publication challenge uh, get added to the patient dossier, patent dossier submitted regulatory? Um, Dr. Uh, Yunus, you have put this question. I presume you are stating that what I have highlighted is the standard practice within pharmacy. Is that correct, uh, Dr. Yunus? And uh, I agree with you, if this is in fact the correct practice for regulators, then those people who undertake trials outside this regulatory framework 
should in fact also follow the same practice that regulators deploy in giving approvals. I, I totally concur with your comment, uh, Dr. Yunus. I'm happy happy to take any further comments or questions via chat or through live comment. Okay, thank you, presenters. We also have people. Yeah, we have people here physically who have some questions. Are you with us, sir? Yes, I am there. there is a question uh, so there's so dr uh, hiba has asked a question that you have been part of a new patent for a new drug you say this is an animal study so look my presentation has been entirely about human randomized control trials i believe there are integrity standards also for animal studies so i urge you strongly to seek what your what the standards are for animal studies i would also urge you to seek what the standards are in uh, the regulatory framework where where uh, uh, where where you at some stage will submit this evidence and please follow all those standards i believe transparency will be the strongest principle that you will be expected to follow uh, in in relation to this animal study that you that you put forward i have time to take any questions that anybody wishes to put to me uh, via the microphone in the audience i'm very happy to do that thank you uh, my question is related to the study you mentioned where you did cluster randomization and you ask for a waiver of the informed consent i couldn't figure out the reason why you should ask for a waiver yet the unit of uh, analysis was going to be the individual that individual not the class okay so uh thank you for this question i provided you this as an example uh, I was not making a recommendation that you should always seek a waiver. I simply provided you as an example to show that it is possible with justification to seek approval from ethics committee for things that can make your research simpler to conduct. Now, it is not necessary that ethics committee will give you that approval. But you as a researcher, if you feel that there is a justification, for example, if, if the outcome data are routinely collected and the patient does not have to go through any additional testing or investigation, then maybe you have a justification to seek approval from ethics committee. Now, if the ethics committee does not give you that approval, then of course you did not. You cannot uh, just assume that uh, you can waive informed consent. But I present that as an example to ask you to be brave in your planning, and with justification to ask important and possibly even difficult question to the ethics committee, and then work according to the approval that is provided to you by the ethics committee you must work within the framework of the approval given by the committee i hope that it addresses the question you raised all right thank you there's another question here please go ahead I, I, I cannot hear if there is another question. I'm happy to take another question. Please go ahead. Uh, 
I can hear you now more clearly. Yes, thank you. So to, to repeat what I've said, I, I hope you hear me now. I can hear you now. Please go can ahead. Can you confirm whether you hear me? I can hear you now. Please go ahead. Perfect. Thank you for, for the very nice presentation. I I am terribly sorry, but I got disconnected and I cannot hear you well. One of the things you've talked about, and that is a publication of the statistical analysis plan and the study protocols. I'm part of some trial we do ahead to show. Maybe I'm the same. Can you hear now? Look, I let me just, if you can hear me, please confirm if I understood your question. Is it something to do right. with the location? Your, Do you hear me? Yes, your your question is about the statistical analysis plan, correct? Yes, yes, but I didn't mention the question yet. Okay, please go ahead. Please uh, tell me what is your question. Okay, perfect. So my question is, <clears throat> Would you recommend publication of the study protocol as being a okay? So, look, I understand your question is that you are asking if the statistical analysis plan should be published. Is that correct? Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, yes. If you are you asking if the statistical analysis plan should be published? Sir, the participant Dr. Mahan, is if you can hear me, just question, let me know by Sir, the participant is typing the question because there's some voice uh, issue. Yeah, please yeah, tell us what is the question. Yes. He he's typing it, sir. Just just a minute, please. Thank you. Please go ahead. Okay, Maham, that's a, that's a good question. Okay. I, 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 Dr. Maham, I understand the question. Can I proceed with an answer? So, look, it is correct that protocols are not frequently published. It is also correct that statistical analysis plans are not frequently published. But there is no reason why they shouldn't be. Now, you are taking part in a, in, a, in, a, in a course or workshop that is giving you advice concerning best practice. I think you should not expect to just do what has been done in the past. 
you should expect yourself to do better than and be more transparent than what has been done in the past. I urge all of you who are going to take part in trials and undertake their own trials that you should publish your protocols. You should publish your statistical analysis plans. Now, protocols and statistical analysis plans may be published in journals, but they can also be published on the prospective registration website or on other publication platforms. For example, the Open Science Framework offers this option for you to publish uh, your protocol and uh, your data analysis plan, but also to share your data. And there are other, the various other preprint sites that allow, would allow you to publish uh, these documents that go along with your trial. So I hope we are encouraging you to do better than what is currently standard practice. And that should be the idea that Comstack trials or Comstack country trials show what is the future correct, enhanced, and high level standard that all other countries doing trials should follow. Dr. Maham, can you confirm if that answer is received? Yes, yes, sir. Thank you very much for your time. Sir, we have three more questions, but we will take them only if you have time. Look, I have 10 more minutes, but please don't forget, I will be available tomorrow during the systematic review meeting, and then I will be happy to take the questions about today, tomorrow also. Okay, all right, sir. I think we'll save these questions for tomorrow. I think that would work much better for me if we can leave right. the question for tomorrow, except okay. for one last question, which is on the ch ch chat from Dr. Yunus, that safety is of prime importance. Uh, I think the question is, should safety be of primary of efficacy for both research and protocol? Well, of course, safety should be prime importance, but please, the colleagues who are talking to you in the course about safety, uh, uh, when you talk about prime importance, that is correct. But when we are talking about what is primary outcome, what is secondary outcome, please make a distinction between outcome required for planning sample size and the safety monitoring for patients taking part in a trial. And I urge you to have this discussion uh, during the two days of your course. Although I am not able to take part in this discussion, uh, because I'm not physically present and I've got to bring this me this webinar of mine to close just now. But if there is a remaining question about this aspect, we'll be very happy to cover this tomorrow and when I, when I, when I turn up for my presentation. Dr. Right, Maham, please, could I bring my presentation to close? Yes, yes, sir. Thank you very much for your time, sir. Thank okay, you. Thank you very much. And uh, inshallah, tomorrow we'll have a chance to talk more about today's presentation and about systematic reviews. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So we'll, we'll see you tomorrow. tomorrow. Bye -bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Thank you, sir.